Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's program called Change Gamers with Patrick Jagoda and Ashlyn Sparrow. Games come in many forms. These days we usually think of video games, but of course board games and puzzles have been very popular for centuries, and lots of people love to participate in role-playing games and escape rooms too. We tend to think of games as entertainment, stress relief, and fun, and they are. But games can also be tools for building empathy and understanding, for teaching, for challenging us to use our brains in new ways. And games can be used to crowdsource data and research and to help us visualize the future. Games are big industry and have a huge cultural impact. They're also a serious aesthetic medium deserving of serious scholarly research. Tonight's program is about how games can create deep and meaningful encounters with important human questions. And we have two bleeding edge scholars who have made game research the focal point of their work. Together, Patrick Jagoda and Josh Ashlyn Sparrow will discuss a series of games, including their own digital and analog game projects, including games with implications for learning and social justice. Patrick Jagoda is a professor of English and Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. He's, a, he's the co-founder of the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab and the Transmedia Story Lab. He also serves as executive editor of the interdisciplinary journal Critical Inquiry. He's the faculty director of the Weston Game Lab and the Media Arts and Design minor at the University of Chicago. His books include Network Aesthetics, The Game Worlds of Jason Rohrer with Michael Mazels, and Experimental Games, which will be published in October 2020 by the University of Chicago Press. He's also directed several games, including the alternate reality games Speculation in 2012, The Parasite in 2017, very prescient, and Terrarium 2019. Ashlyn Sparrow is the assistant director of the Weston Game Design Lab at University of Chicago. She's worked on scholarly board, card, and digital games and public health apps. She works closely with researchers and faculty to lead in the development of serious games, interactive learning experiences, and digital media art with youth and for youth. She has a degree in informational information sciences and technology design and development from Penn State, and a master's in entertainment technology from Carnegie Mellon. Please join me in welcoming Patrick Jagoda and Ashlyn Sparrow. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, yes, for this call and oh, response. Um, so before we start, um, we just want to get a sense of um, broadly, I guess, how many people play video games in the audience? Um, how many That's people good. play board games? Yes. So good. How about... How many of you are artists? Okay. Excellent. Good. Okay. That'll, that'll help us a yeah. little bit with, with how to go through some of this. Um, so, okay, we just wanted to start at a really high level, not assuming that people think about games as often as we do, which is probably not good for your brain, but that's kind of what we do. Um, just to think about like what a huge art form games have become, and first of all, at the level of profitability, right? So um, games have now overtaken film and music in terms of their profitability. So film makes about um, you know forty billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Games are at about a hundred and five billion. Uh, so f um, games and television far exceed film and music. So for instance, when Grand Theft Auto V came out in 2013, it made about a billion dollars in three days, which at that point made it the uh, fastest selling piece of entertainment in history. Um, the Avengers film may have exceeded that or, or come so, yep. close to it, but uh, games tend to be on the higher end of that. Mm -hmm. Fortnite, very popular uh, online battle arena style game. Um, when it first came out, approximately 220 million people were playing it in the first month alone. Um, and also, it's so popular that it's moving into this kind of transmedia space where you have a popular DJ like Marshmallow giving a concert in Fortnite and having 200 million people just in this digital world listening to this digital concert. 
Yeah, and, and we have things like Pokemon Go. So it isn't just video games, right? It's also s at least formally experimental pieces uh, that use, in this case, augmented reality. And Pokemon Go, within the first few months of its release, had been downloaded 550 million times, um, just to give you a sense of the scale. And many of those people didn't stick with Pokemon Go because it <laughs> maybe wasn't the greatest game as, as a game, um, but it was a really amazing social experiment, right? Um, and opened up a platform for possible future interventions in, in perhaps more interesting ways. Um, you know, we also see this with uh, independent games, right? So, so far we've been giving you like very mainstream games, but games like Limbo and Braid when they first came out um, also sold uh, serious numbers of units and opened up the possibility for art games and independent games uh, really taking off. I mean, this happened around the same time that uh, the uh, Smithsonian, for instance, uh, and a number of other art museums around, around the US uh, started having video game oriented shows. So there was also the elevation of games uh, to an art form um, at the same time as, as all of this kind of profit stuff is happening. And so also thinking about the amount of time people spend in, this, in a game, uh, we have a game like Call of Duty Black Ops where people over about a year or so, or maybe even- This one, 45, 45 days. 45 days, exactly, yeah. oh my gosh. Spend a collective amount of like 600 million hours in this game in 45 days alone. So not only are we thinking of games in terms of money and uh, we're also thinking about them in terms of time. And, and 600 million hours is the equivalent of 68,000 years. Yes. I think that's worth thinking about for a second, like yes. what it means for people collectively to play a game over 45 days for the equivalent of 68,000 years. Like if you could take that time, energy, and attention and divert it towards something else, like where would that get us? Mm -hmm. League of Legends, great esports game. Um, also, a huge population of people, um, about 200 million uh, players in the first year alone. Um, again, thinking of a transmedia experience, we now also have uh, K-pop groups coming from League of Legends, thinking about KDA, um, and also their new band, True Damage, right? So we're, again, moving from this space of playing games, the amount of money that the games are generating, and also the music that it's actually enabling people to listen to. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. so this moves us into you know, like we are talking about why games are this huge cultural form, but it also comes from this other aspect of games for learning that we are really interested um, and what our, we our research is focused on. Um, so we like to quote Salen and Zimmerman um, in terms of their rules of playbook about what is a game. And essentially it's a game, uh, a system in which players engage in an artificial con conflict defined by rules um, and the results uh, in a quantifiable outcome. So this is our definition of why we like to talk about games. Um, but we're also interested in this uh, serious games movement. It was really prevalent, and it still is, but really started to take off in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. Um, and we like to cl uh, quote Clark Apt. Um, he came out with a book in the 1970s where he talked about serious games. Um, and serious games are essentially games that are moving beyond just pure entertainment. They're supposed to educate people and give people new skills. So there are a variety of different games that are out there. Um, so we have games like Phone Story calling, uh, coming from Molly Industria, where they're thinking about the ways that phones are constructed all the way from mining in Africa all the way through the entire uh, production chain. We also have another game coming from Carnegie uh, Mellon University um, where you are talking about the conflict between Palestine and Israel and your objective is trying to uh, create peace, right? So there's a number of games that are out there that are speaking to this serious games movement. Um, we also are moving not only from the digital space, but also to the analog space. So we have games like Application Crunch, which is a card game, um, which is actually supposed to teach young people how to apply to college and all the loopholes that they have to go and face. And also thinking of the, uh, the medical space, Occam's Razor is a game where you're focused on how to diagnose patients, um, and it's really meant to train uh, medical students and work with doctors in order to uh, teach them these skills. And Application Crunch came out of the University of Southern California, yes. which has, you know, arguably the best video game design program. I mean, University of Chicago is coming for Soon. USC, but mm -hmm. USC yeah. is quite great. 
So uh, a bunch of uh, game theorists and uh, folks who are studying these uh, artifacts talk about the learning benefits of games. We quote people like James Paul Gee, uh, Jane McGonigal, um, Tracy Fullerton, uh, where we're talking about games activating multiple learning styles, right? So not only can you like look and, and interact with games, but you can actually also, you know, think about deduction or thinking about sound in games. They encourage uh, a safe space for failure, right? It's one of the only mediums that we can interact with where you can fail over and over and over again, and people will get right back up and try again. So this also tells us that, you know, we have a space where we can think about curiosity, motivation, effort, and players are willing to interact with these different systems and so on. So, so it's worth thinking about, like, if you thought about games at a certain moment, um, you might have thought about chess or Go or a little bit later in the 1980s about Super Mario Brothers or something like that, right? So at a certain moment, games were relegated to a fairly limited number of genres and a limited number of examples. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of things that Ashlyn was just talking about in terms of serious games and educational games and art games and various genres of mainstream games that we didn't see before, like MOBAs or something mm -hmm. like that, or survival horror games, which wouldn't have been around in the 1980s um, in the same form, um, suggest just how broad that category has become uh, by the year 2020. Um, so when we say game now, we mean, we mean a lot of different things. And so the kind of game that we want to talk to you about today isn't like the ones that we talked about just now, and there are, there are reasons for that. Um, so we're going to talk about a game that we worked on that had to do with climate change. So it still enters into the serious space of producing an intervention around um, a serious topic, but maybe doesn't quite fit into the category of educational game like, um, you know, um, Oregon Trail or something like that, I don't know. Um, or Math Blaster, um, but, but it, it, was, it was a game that, uh, where we wanted to get people to think about the various issues, the scientific issues, the artistic issues, the humanistic issues that had to do with climate change. And our, our thinking around this, so we started um, working on this game um, a couple of years ago, and, um, and the thinking behind it was, you know, this was around the time where for the first time in US history, over 50% of people counted themselves as concerned believers about the fact that global warming and climate change were actually happening, uh, which is just blows my mind that it took so long, but, but there it is. Um, and it's slightly better when you, when you look at some, some things like um, whether people believe that um, most scientists believe global warming is occurring or believe global warming is caused by human activities. Um, so it's closer to, closer to two thirds. Um, but just last summer, when we were working on this game, was also the moment, really the second summer, when there was an explosion of news energy around climate change. I mean, even though this has been an issue for decades, right? Scientists have been talking about this for decades. Certain policymakers have been talking about this for decades. These last two years have been the moment where this turned into a news frame, and because of Greta Thunberg and various other activists, um, we saw these, these marches um, last summer. Um, We've also seen various art forms grappling with climate change as a backdrop to the project that we wanted to work on. So in the uh, space of film, uh, you see films like Snow Snowpiercer, which are very much about climate change, uh, Parasite, which could be read in some ways as being about climate change, or um, films like Paul Schrader's First Reformed, which are quieter, more artistic interventions into issues of ecological crisis. Um, but outside of film, you also have novels like Kim Stanley Robinson's New York 2140, um, and you have graphic novels like Here, and various forms of performance art. So you see these sorts of things um, coming up, people trying to respond to the very unrepresentable and high-scale um, issue that is climate change. Um, I'm teaching a course on climate change right now uh, to some undergraduates at the University of Chicago, and one thing that I find remarkable is um, how unconvinced they are by most climate art that we have thus far, right? So their response is often, great, we have representations of it out there, but is reading a novel or seeing a film really going to motivate me to change my habits or go out and live life in a fundamentally different way than I do now? 
Um, and we have a lot of deep discussions about that, but I understand that impulse, right? I mean, there was a time where you would see a documentary and it might fundamentally change something about the way that you lived, but there's such an oversaturation of say like expose documentaries, uh, which I love watching, but that I have to admit very rarely change my day-to-day -day behavior. Um, and so for us, the issue was not just making a game about climate change, but also using a form that wasn't so familiar to people that they would just take it for granted, right? So the question wasn't just about describing climate change, it was about changing at least a certain player base um, to act differently around this issue. So instead of video games, instead of board games, we turned to the form of alternate reality games. So um, I guess I'm going to ask you another question because um, this is what we as game designers do is we try to invoke minor forms of interactivity whenever <laughs> possible. Um, how many of you have heard of this form of, of alternate reality games? Fantastic, okay. wow. How many of you have played an alternate reality game? Okay, so like two, two people, three. Okay, are you seeing more? I was like I'm, four, I'm thinking it's like, like there was I saw three, three. okay. Shadow the lights are very person bright. in the back. Okay, <laughs> somewhere between three and five <laughs> is the other person in the back. Um, so I'll give you a really quick breakdown because this is, um, it's a little bit different from the kind of screen-based experiences that we started with like mm -hmm. Fortnite, for instance. So alternate reality games have five main um, attributes. So a high level way of thinking about them is they're kind of like uh, heavily mediated and narrative driven scavenger hunts that unfold both online and in physical space. So imagine that you're a protagonist of a novel and the novel is taking place all around you um, and you and a bunch of other people have to move through an experience uh, through a series of media. So this is an experience that's not limited by a single medium or platform. Um, the experience might move from email to theatrical productions, to videos, uh, to video games, to augmented reality, to anything out there basically. Um, second of all, the stories in these games are broken into, into discrete pieces that players have to discover and reconfigure on their own. So um, much is left to the player in terms of how the story comes together. Uh, third of all, these are not single player games. The player networks are participatory and collective. Uh, fourth of all, very importantly, um, these games have a this is not a game aesthetic. In other words, you're never told that you're playing a game explicitly. Right, you fall into the game through what's called a rabbit hole, uh, which is, for instance, like an email or um, um, or a character friending you on Facebook or Instagram, and you following that account and realizing that something is amiss. Right, so one of one of the elements of artistry in making these games is finding a way to invite people into the experience without telling them, "Hey, you're playing a game." Uh, which completely changes the frame of reference and basically asks them to negotiate the status of the event that they're participating in, which actually adds forms of agency and thought that aren't available in most traditional video games. Um, and then fifth of all, these are oftentimes long duration experiences, right? So they're not like two hours like a film or even like 30 hours like um, a video game. Some video games are much longer. Um, but these, off these games oftentimes take place over several weeks or several months. And so you're really living in a world more than merely experiencing a narrative. Um, because we're at the Hammer and because there, there, there are people who are artists and are interested in art, um, I just want to say a little bit about where this form comes from. We could do an entire talk just on the, um, the art historical precursors of ARGs. Uh, or args, I like args because it's like, it, it's, it, there's, it's such an undifferentiated form which is part of its power and it sounds like some kind of like, I don't know, some, some alien dying or something <laughs> like, like arg. Ar. Um, but anyway, I, I actually think like when we think about args, we go all the way back to the 1950s and we think about um, concept art for instance, we think about John Cage and, and uh, Namjoon Paik and people who early on were thinking about intermedia relations and the way that art worked across media. We also think about collectives like the Situationists um, and Fluxus um, who were very much thinking about play in games and how play in games uh, beyond game design could be integrated into everyday life or could alter the way that we think and act. Um, and in the case of, of both of them, right, there was also a very heavily political dimension to the work that they were doing. 
Um, beyond that, we might think of things like network art from uh, the 1980s and the 1990s. For instance, uh, Jody or something like that. Um, glitch art or art that was thinking about net prov or network improvisation or was thinking not about like the images on the screen or the sounds that you hear primarily, but was thinking about how, how to use art to connect or disconnect people in interesting ways. So like the relation is the art, right? More than the, than the object. Um, in the case of this. Um, we also think about um, alternate reality games as a case of Wagner's Gesamtkunstwerk, right? So like the total work of art. And so when Wag Wagner's talking about the total work of art, um, he's talking about opera, right? Opera is incorporating all of these different forms of art. But in some ways, alternate reality games are an even more radical version of that. And they're more radical because they unfold um, at a transmedia moment, right? At a moment of what Henry Jenkins calls convergence culture. Um, at a moment in which like we have all of these media industries and we have very easy access um, to various different media and they um, are a part of our lives in a way that broadcast media weren't as centrally, I would argue. We still have broadcast media, but we also now have um, the you know, relationships with algorithms and social media and video games that are, I think, fundamentally different from what we saw earlier in the 20th century or the mid-20th century. Um, I don't have a slide for this, but I, I would also say that another unfortunate influence for alternate reality games was marketing. So like the earliest cases of alternate reality games were actually experiments in viral marketing. And I find this exciting because in many artistic cases, like, avant-garde artists come up with like a really good idea and then capitalism steals it, mm -hmm. right? And like reappropriates it or like um, incorporates it in some way. This is the exact opposite. This was like alternate reality games in their earliest form like came from within capitalism, right? It was like these ways of getting people's attention um, to get them to see a movie or buy a game or, or buy a product. And it was only later that artists started making alternate reality games that either had serious mm -hmm. content or um, were trying to change the world in some way. So there's an interesting inversion um, to what one sometimes sees with the emergence of new art forms, and I find that powerful. So we have a long portfolio of doing these kind of alternate reality games. And so this is actually coming from the Game Changer Chicago Design Lab, which we both were in, and then we kind of started to expand on this work in the Weston Game Lab. So our, I, we started working together since 2013 um, for the source and then working together onward. And then Patrick started uh, quite uh, early in 2011. Um, so the project that we're really gonna focus on is Terrarium, but we do wanna talk a little bit about uh, the parasite um, in 2017. And I just want to point out that we used that name prior to the yes. Academy Award winning yes. film, which is wonderful. It's but, fantastic. Um, but we did not rip it off. Plus, there's a definite article, so there's a That's little bit true. of a difference. Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I'll say one thing about yeah, this, and if you want to give the overview. Um, I just want to point out, like, we're very lucky because the person who actually made this thing that we're going to talk about, Dave Carlson, is here. Yes, He's an amazing fun. installation artist and graphic novel writer and uh, does, like, a hundred other things. but. As part of this larger alternate reality game that Ashton will talk about in a moment, uh, Dave built these like 11 immense um, book structures um, that were like, I, I, you know, like 12 feet tall in some way and had um, books and media incorporated into them. And there's, you'll, you'll see maybe later like a whole like fog system above it. And there was like live sound mixing in this space, but there were like 11 unique sculptures um, that corresponded with things that were happening in this broader game. Um, but this ended up being a kind of centerpiece for, for this particular project. So the, t uh, the Parasite. So this was actually our first um, foray into creating a game around orientation at the University of Chicago. Um, and so what we were looking at trying to do was thinking about new ways to get uh, incoming first years oriented to UChicago, also thinking about how we can uh, capture first generation college students, people of color, the LGBTQ community, who feel a little on the outskirts when they first come to college. And so we're trying to think through ways that, since you know they're the, in this liminal space between going to college and then also being at 
call like first graduating from high school and then going to college that we can actually think through how to form really new and interesting habits um, here so we're we were hoping to get students to uh, collaborate think through diversity and inclusion but also again 21st literary uh, century literacies like uh, communication leadership so on and so forth yeah, and, and, and this game ended up having, we're not gonna say a lot more about it, but it had about 121 unique objects that students had to collectively find, and each of those 121 objects had a game trail associated with it in some way. So this is like a very large scale game from the standpoint of like the diversity mm -hmm. of different um, challenges, I guess. And it also unfolded across a transmedia environment. So there were characters who were like, you know, mostly cr producing like podcasts or YouTube videos or uh, little games online or really complex puzzles that would take days to solve um, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so we did that in 2017 and that really was an experiment with like, how can we take this form of alternate reality games that started around 2001, 2000, 2001, and so at, you know, it's about 20 years old at this point, and how can we do something that's ped pedagogical but not mm -hmm. educational, right? So we didn't wanna make a game that was just like hitting players over the head and wasn't fun and was just like, you have to learn this thing. It was basically like bad education, right? Or like an interactive quiz or something. So we were like, how can we create a game where like they're making the world alongside us? They don't know that it's a game because we're not gonna tell them. So in the case of the, the parasite, um, the narrative had to do with the secret society that had existed at the University of Chicago since 1896. Mm -hmm. So we, we uh, created fake documents for the secret society, hid them in special collections at the university, hid them online, and created all of this evidence of this 100 plus year uh, secret society that was like the exact opposite of the way that like Yale's skull and bones operates, right? So rather than like engaging in hazing and all of that terrible stuff that secret societies do, it was the exact opposite. It was um, committed to its own obsolescence. Mm -hmm. So it was, people were willing to like step down to allow the organization to move on and change and they were like radically inclusive in a way that again, secret societies generally aren't. Mm -hmm. um, so this game didn't really have a content beyond the story that it was trying to tell. But then, in 2019, we thought to ourselves, okay, so we have a proof of concept behind this kind of game. What if we did something around a really big issue? Mm -hmm. And so we started thinking about what that really big issue would be in 2017, and we decided on climate change because we thought it would be a way of bringing together artists, humanists, social scientists, and scientists, right? It was an issue that actually mattered to everyone and not to just some subfield. Um, again, we didn't realize that it would be so front and center in the news when we first started working on it, uh, but that ended up attracting even more players. Mm -hmm. um, to give you just a high level sense, so, so first of all, um, a lot of people worked on this game. Dave Carlson again came back and built a, uh, an amazing room that you'll see in a, in a video that we're going to show. Um, but there were, there were people all over the map. So um, I co-directed this game with Heidi Coleman, who is a performance studies person, uh, Kristen Schilt, who's a sociologist at the University of Chicago, uh, who helped us not only make the game, but then also study its efficacy. Um, Ashlyn worked on various game and puzzle related things. Mm -hmm. And I won't go through the whole list, but just to give you a sense of like the range of um, specializations and capacities that went into forming this. We were drawing people from theater, film, game design, um, and many, many other areas. This is just a small um, subset in the sense of what went into that. Um, so, yeah, you wanna say yeah. something about the narrative? So let's talk about the narrative here. Uh, so here we have decided to go into a sci-fi narrative where we uh, have, the figured out that there's a weird time communication between our present day 2019 at the time and 2049. So some key terms that you'll see highlighted in blue, uh, our forecasters was the lab that we created, and this is a lab that housed faculty, staff, and student interns that were also working on this project. Basically, all of the game designers um, in a way that the narrative, again, signals that this is not a game, right? The terrarium was this experimental biome that is actually uh, the Mansueto Library at UChicago, um, where underneath it, that is where the terrarium and all of our time communication uh, devices were in the year 2049. 
Um, the device that allowed us to communicate uh, in the future was called the SPORE device. And so the overall narratives, we uh, in 2019 have figured out some, found some blueprints, um, and this allowed us to connect with the year 2049. Uh, what, what we weren't sure what would happen once we turned on this device and what would happen if someone would respond back to us, right? Um, and so we'll actually kind of go into some of the rabbit holes and some of the gameplay, um, but we actually worked alongside actual faculty at the university, approximately 30 plus faculty, again, from all these different disciplines who actually helped to bring uh, students into the experience. And we did this by having them talk about the weird time communication that they heard and un uncovered in their own research and in their own labs. Yeah, but, but, but the main narrative was basically this communication between the present day, 2019, and 30 years into the future, 2049. Uh, and we created four different scenarios mm -hmm. over time. So the SPORE device, which Dave built, um, basically would connect 2019 to a different version of 2049, um, um, and the players kept looking for a better version, a more interesting version. To give you a high-level sense of how this unfolded, the game ran from May to September, so it was like a long-duration project. Um, and in a way, because this is a world and you can't just press pause, people may be like looking for what the game actually is, um, even in moments where you're not deploying new materials. So we had to be kind of like always on and ready to, um, to be these characters, not to pretend to be them, but to actually live in this, in this other world. Um, you'll see this all in a video that we're gonna show you in a few minutes. We actually created a, a, a 15 minute documentary about the entire process of the game, or at least elements of it, uh, that we haven't shown before in this form, but it'll give you a, a sense of the arc and some of the actual visuals of, of what this was like. It's so hard to explain that we decided that making the short film would just be an easier way of communicating right. it visually and at an audio level. Mm -hmm. um, but before we get there, it's worth thinking again about like, how do you get people into this kind of experience right. if there's no start screen? And so one of the ways that we did it is there's an email that goes out to these 1,700 or 1,800 incoming students at the university. And usually it's a pretty straightforward, boring email that just says, hey, congratulations for getting into the University of Chicago, welcome. Um, but they allowed us to take over the postscript of that email and we built a puzzle into that email which students within five minutes, I think because they were bored with their AP classes, yeah. having already taken the AP exams, um, jumped into. Like within minutes, they created a Google Doc, and so we saw like hundreds of students like copying and pasting and moving information around and trying to figure out what the hell was going on, right? Whether the university website had been hacked, mm -hmm. whether this puzzle was coming from the administration or for, from someone else. And the puzzles led to a series of fake syllabi that we actually created and put online um, that were from the year 2021. So they were like futuristic syllabi uh, that themselves had puzzles embedded into them. And eventually all of this led to a central website and that website opened into part two. So part two of this experience um, relied upon Twitch. So how many of you use Twitch as a platform? Cool, okay, it's a much, cooler audience, yeah, I feel like, than we, than we usually exactly. have. There are more and more people. Um, for the handful of you that didn't raise your hands, that's fine. Um, uh, Twitch is basically um, a, a platform where people will, for instance, like one person will play a video game and then a bunch of people will watch that person uh, mm -hmm. playing a video game, but also um, chat back, right? So it's a social environment in addition to being a spectatorship environment. And it's not just focused on video games. People might be cooking something mm -hmm. and there might be like a cook cooking channel, but video games tend to dominate this space. For part two, we asked ourselves, how can we make Twitch as a platform interesting in an artistic way? And the way that we decided to do that is by uh, creating a live action video game or an inverse escape room. So the idea was you as a player, all of you, would um, sign into a Twitch channel that was connected to the year 2049. And on the other end, you would see video of someone who was trapped in a room and needed to get out of that room. Right, so like in a usual escape room, you go into an escape room, you have an hour, you solve a bunch of puzzles and you get out or you don't. In this case, the idea was someone else is trapped in a room and they don't know how they got there and they really need to get out. You need to help them gather information and as a group, find a way out of that space. Mm -hmm. 
And that was the first of four rooms. But basically, through all of these rooms, we were playing with asymmetrical game design. So the idea of what if the person in the room has different information from the players on the other end? How do you play with that asymmetry in interesting ways? And we had a bunch of experiments with mm -hmm. how you might do that. I would also add that we were heavily inspired by Twitch Plays Pokemon, right? So this collective experience of people using Twitch and then playing Pokemon, putting actually inputting those uh, inputs and moving the characters and fighting the other characters, how could we actually leverage that into a new uh, game form? Mm -hmm. And then you want, you want to say something about Yeah, so the Futures Design Challenge was the third component of Terrarium. So this allowed us to also capture a group of students that usually were not necessarily interested in kind of the artistic kind of games that we were used to creating. This allowed us to actually capture uh, folks who were studying uh, economics or science. Um, so the Futures Design Challenge was a, a design challenge where we had people form teams uh, of three to five students, um, and they would actually be given a champion, which was a, an older UChicago student, who would then help them work on a pitch. And they could actually think of an idea that would help solve climate change, some intervention, but it could range from the sciences, from the arts, um, in the intersections of games and performance, right? So we were really trying to allow a space for people to work interdisciplinarily um, and think about a new way that we can, you know, maybe solve climate change. And we were also, most of this happened online, right? It was only the last part that actually happened on campus because these students, you have to remember, were like in Delhi and Beijing mm -hmm. and um, LA and places like that um, for all of these months preceding. So we were trying to form a community online um, uh, prior to them meeting uh, face to face. Um, so a large part of this was also thinking about, I mean, escape rooms are great and people will go to like Shanghai or uh, Melbourne and play like really interesting escape rooms. But of course there's like a huge carbon footprint that goes with like having to travel to those places to have those site specific experiences. So our gambit was how do you take the really amazing mm -hmm. experience of a tabletop game or um, an escape room and put that online and use something like Twitch to make that a dynamic experience. So we're gonna show you two things. We're gonna show you about two minutes of an early rabbit hole video. So early on, after the students' players found um, these puzzles, they were rewarded with a 16 minute video. We're only gonna show you two minutes. In that video, you'll see a series of faculty members from the university talking about how they've been potentially um, uh, received communications from the year 2049. So again, we were leaning into the realism of this, and one of the ways we were leaning into that is by getting, you know, 30 plus adults with like, you know, like MacArthur Genius Prizes and stuff mm -hmm. to basically say, yep, I, I got a communication from the year 2049. And we got about like 50 students who were current students at the University of Chicago to also create these like short little videos on their phones and post them. Um, so we're gonna do two minutes of this mm -hmm. to give you a sense. And there are, there are also games within this video. So this is a gamified video that they had to figure out. I was walking to work from uh, my house and realized that something was wrong with my podcast player. The, the messages come in a scrambled but intriguingly scrambled way. You think that somebody you knew was writing to you or you think maybe it's a little spam, but it's the weirdest text. The quantum botanist, uh, you know, Xeno programmer, interruptions that almost sounded like old-fashioned um, I, I don't know like back in the days of like radio when you would turn the dial one day I found one image that seemed to be part of a blueprint they have numbers and charts and things maybe there's some kind of you know consciousness arising some group that I hadn't heard of sent me an email with a with an ice core that was showing the years 2050 this sounds exactly like the plot of contact when you believe that the future is communicating with you, that's kind of like saying you, you believe that angels are talking to you. As a historian, the only parallel I can think through, strange things happened in British India in 1857, when people suddenly noticed chapatis, you know, the live and flat Indian bread. Suddenly chapatis appeared in villages and got transmitted, transferred from one village to another and people didn't understand why the chapatis were appearing. And it itself created uh, an atmosphere of anxiety, some fear, but also of anticipation.
Well, it could be they're coming to Chicago because Chicago has always liked to talk about itself with a, what I would call a rhetoric of, um, this is the professional historian in me, not the lo local uh, cheerleader or mar marketeer. Um, uh, it's uncanny the way in which the university has claimed for itself what I would call a special mission in American higher education. Okay. You may end up in understanding things and learning about things, learning, learning, learning about things that are uh, even more frightening than what you thought when you began your, your intellectual journey. As you can hear there, there's Morse code built into it. There are also like flashed images where you would have to pause the video and look at it more closely. Uh, there are hours of things that you could do with this video in addition um, to watching it. Um, but um, yeah, so th this was one of our many, many opening gambits and using video as a way of inviting students um, and players uh, into this experience. I also want to say it's a, it's a really great example of showing the fact that University of Chicago faculty were willing to play, right? We're actually a very playful university and they made up these stories all on their own, right? We gave them a little bit of information saying, oh, you know, we have Xeno programmers or we're the forecast lab, but then they took their own kind of knowledge and research and backgrounds and then built the whole narrative that you're seeing in these videos around the small bits of information that we gave them. And, and this is very different from a lot of different art, art forms where there's a top-down vision that comes from like an auteur, right? Or something where you have like two hours of very emotionally controlled storytelling, which, which is great. Like I love going to the movies, I love watching television, but I think the pleasures and the artistry of something like an alternate reality game are very different mm -hmm. because it is, there's this like collective improv, right? Constantly people are su suggesting parts of the narrative which we then have to decide whether we incorporate or leave behind, but it's really shared world building um, that doesn't have the meta level of like Dungeons and Dragons or something, right, where you know you're playing a game. In this case, the incorporation has to be very subtle. Um, so on that note, we wanna show you this, um, this 15 minute documentary that really gives you a sense of like what the entire game was like. We'll show you that and then I think um, we'll probably open things up to conversation mm -hmm. um, because there's a lot more to say about it. And if you don't have questions, we, we can talk ad infinitum, but we'd much rather hear from you. Um, so we'll just, we'll run this. And this, we finished this about a week ago um, and we're collecting footage for this from the very beginning of the game. I'm a U Chicago student. I heard that you guys were collecting evidence of strange things happening. It was a really weird, lucid daytime dream. Yeah. All of the dates have been, we're populating to... The message was from 2049. They were really, really adamant that the sea level would rise. Don't go in the water. It's called an alternate reality game. You may end up in understanding things and learning about things that are uh, even more frightening than what you thought when you began your, your intellectual journey. It's a heavier level of the way stories work. So my first reaction was, this is the most you Chicago thing to do. It's something that no one has ever seen before. You have this jumble mess and you have to make sense of what it is, knowing that you have a, an ultimatum in mind. And I thought it would just end up being a small handful of puzzles, but it was something that led to something much bigger. The story of Terrarium is the future has gone very badly wrong. Global warming. Totalitarianism. Climate change. In the present, you can always keep distancing the future and saying, that's not going to be my generation, and that's not going to be something that I'm personally contributing to, uh, but we are. Will we protect the environment? Will we prevent dictatorships from coming into power? How it would feel to live 30 years in the future? It was exhilarating and terrifying to have that knowledge, to see how the world will be, and to know that your actions have to change that. Terrarium is an alternate reality game that we're creating for incoming students at the University of Chicago. We really wanted to create a world that convinced students that they were communicating with the year 2049. A group of faculty members built a device. As a result, the world of 2049 shifted. Because science fiction defamiliarizes people to their present and helps them think more effectively. And alternate reality games use what's called, uh, this is not a game aesthetic. 
You have to design bigger than what the players can imagine. Everything from online documents, design challenge, emails, puzzles, student videos, and the course called The Ends of Civilization, faculty videos, reverse escape room. We created this lab, um, a logo and a uniform. The faculty had a blast wearing blue lab coats and playing the role of characters who were interacting with the year 2049. Terrarium is a contribution to serious games research, experimenting with contemporary online platforms. There is an email that goes from the university to every incoming student in the first year at the University of Chicago. We worked with an amazing puzzle designer, Sandy Weiss, to incorporate a puzzle into that email. The first day that the letter came out, I was on a group chat uh, on Facebook and someone mentioned this like cryptic message and it led me to a syllabus. We created a series of fake syllabi from the year 2021 and then hid puzzles within them. So students were at once getting a reading list of things about climate change uh, but they were also solving these puzzles together. And I ended up going through these puzzles until someone on the Facebook posted I'm stuck and it was somewhere way beyond where I'd gotten. I'm like wow this is a really smart group of people. We designed the puzzles to be collaborative. We didn't want this to be competitive. We didn't want this to be individualistic. We really wanted to create a cooperative. I helped set up the beginnings of what became our Google Doc. This is the history of what happened and how people got to this step. The new puzzle was released. I solved it and I posted it and that, then I was placed into the history document. I discovered that there were all these brilliant people solving all these really cool puzzles. It's kind of like a frenzy, but at the same time, it's a really interesting bonding experience. It was an absolute mess, but also a delight. <laughs> Students were so interested in the puzzle solving, and as a designer, that's incredibly exciting because you, your players are getting ahead of you and you have to work harder in order to keep up. We were communicating around the world. There was a ton of different puzzles the method of solving was cryptic. There would be a link on a specific web page and then just a list of clues that would be apparently random. And you'd have to figure out what that meant. Like the puzzle was not the hard part. The hard part was what does this mean? Every time you play test a puzzle, you get a better sense of, of what the players might like and what might be so overwhelming that they just shut down. It was responsive. A lot of human-centered design. Our most successful puzzles could be solved in about 24, maybe 36 hours. It needs to be hard enough that you feel satisfied in solving it, but it should never make you feel stupid. There was one that really got us stuck. The bullet points were sh different shades. Then someone connected the shading of the bullet points to a board game. I think it was Mastermind or something. And I was like, this is like, absolutely insane, how could anyone possibly think of that? So at that point, I was pretty sucked into the experience. In 2017, we staged The Parasite, our first alternate reality game as part of orientation. Terrarium built on the successes that we had with The Parasite, inviting students into the university. And it also got harder when it went to uh, the live stream. Are you there? I can't see you. We would get a message about when a stream would be appearing, and it was a stream from 2049, so 30 years in the future. So that was weird. Part of our research had to do with the kinds of media and platforms that 17 and 18 year olds are likely to use. Twitch is a live streaming platform. It's very exciting as a designer. It's a new technology that we're not really sure what to do with it yet especially as a place for faculty research, bringing together people to kind of think and engineer. Players were interacting in real time with a live actor who could improvise and change the world and the narrative in response to what they were doing. That's something you can't do in a video game. So basically, each live stream was set in a different version of a future 2049. I'm the anchor. Each of the four worlds had to be realistic, but, but really they had to be interactive so that we were able to do anything that a player asked or was interested in. We were thinking about contemporary escape rooms. We were thinking about older artistic collectives like Flexus and The Situationist. 
The first one was uh, Patrick Jagoda, who had been trapped in a room, and we had to solve these puzzles to get locks open um, so he could get four items out of these bags. So people would work together trying to puzzle out. We were given like a symbol as a clue, and then we had to figure out what in the room corresponded to that symbol and then figure out how to crack that code. And it was very glitchy because obviously it's from 2049, the signal's not the best. So it was kind of a mad rush. There was a set time for each stream. So we had to like milk all of the information out of it before the stream ended. We really moved over into this other world and tried to live by its rules. This is like, you know, there's this real issue of bleed in thinking about live action role playing games. The way that people's personalities move into their characters and the way their characters move back into their everyday personalities. The next live stream was with someone who was communicating with us telepathically. And so their messages would show up on the screen and we have to read them and communicate back. We had to tell this person how to move their body in order to unlock things. For each world, we had a single room and a single character who would convey through their costume, through objects in the room, what had happened 30 years into the future. Designing the world, the set, the costumes led us to revise the narrative and the characters. We reached out and found a really fantastic sound designer. What I'm trying to do is create a little of a dystopian world. In game playing, you have to be rewarded if you, if you solve a piece of that puzzle. There's always an event, an aural event that says, okay. What does your present in 2019 owe to 2049? The third one made ask moral questions. And then at the end of it, something terrible would happen. There was a weird tree with a bunch of water and they do a weird ritual and then we watch those frames very carefully because they uploaded it afterward. So I'd like go through frame by frame and see what happened. All the rituals involved putting a book into the wall. It would be a different book every time. I didn't know if it meant anything, but I had to like pause the frame and see like, here's like the first very blurry half of this title. Here's the second very blurry half of this title. What's the title of the book? And then the fourth one, I think was a game show. Please step forward, contestant four. Question two, what do you think you would bring to the position of being anchor? I think that bugs should be allowed to vote. I think that all- The fourth one was what was really interesting. There had been like extreme overpopulation and so it was a game show to see Have who would be um, the anchor that would connect to the Terry device. We were talking and we were like, why should we have to choose one person? Why can't we just choose not to choose? And I think it broke the game. It allowed us to think about how one might broadcast around the globe and get live feedback and work with lighting, sound, and video elements. Figuring out with all the designers how to make the process come together in a sort of cohesive look. The bunker was a lot of fun to sort of come up with the world and, and think about what the possibilities of communication might have been, to merge completely organic and completely digital technologies into something really beautiful. We had 24 hours between episodes to write and produce and air. There definitely has been a time where I've been watching the stream and going, you know what, this, this is a new form of art. We made it, we touched it. We're inviting you to join the Futures Design Challenge. $5,000 going around. The Futures Design Challenge was a contest that invited students to form teams and to compete with the best idea that they had for how they could combat climate change. You formed a team and you had to come up with a solution to climate change, a part of it, or the whole thing. There was a bunch of different ways to win. I joined a Future Design Challenge team it was Singaporean students, one French student, and me. There was a lot of arguing about what exactly we would make, but we ended up making an app that aims to reduce household electricity consumption. There was also the element of the climate quest. So every time you complete a climate quest, you'll receive points. 
So when we started working on Terrarium, we had just opened the Weston Game Lab and the Media Arts Data and Design Center. And a series of undergraduate interns came into this space on a daily basis and worked on Climate Quest. The Climate Quest gave students a chance to get their hands dirty and design some games that the incoming students could play. In this Climate Quest, we're going to be taking a place and fast forward it into the future. The Climate Quest really showed that tackling climate change is going to be an interdisciplinary issue. We really thought about it as like a live action role playing game. When you think of something like Call of Duty, you can easily tell what a game designer values. So they really value how many other players that you shoot. And that's actually how we came up with this scoring system called CRISP which stands for Collaboration, Research, Inquiry, Service, and Presentation. Which are five skills that we think will be vital in addressing climate change. You'll receive points in one or more of these five categories that'll go on your team's crisp radar. Going into the competition, you basically had to pitch your project. Um, and then present it to a panel of judges. Preliminary round, where multiple groups present it. Electricity consumption data is fed into the app through our houses. Most of them were STEM-based. This process requires negotiation. My team actually did art. You begin at the very top at action or not, and then you would make a choice. Running the Future Design Challenge was incredibly exciting. Orientation at a university can cover a lot of ground, but oftentimes faculty aren't intimately interconnected with what's going on. And so we wanted to invite faculty judges to see these wonderful presentations by incoming students. Uh, to give them feedback, but also to form working relationships with them from day one. The faculty learned as much from each other as the players did. Everybody came out of the Future Design Challenge changed. We made it to the final round. It was awful, it was nerve-wracking. Together we make up Albiotical. Sometimes there is a micro solution to a macro problem. We also plan on making as many aspects of the operation eco-friendly as possible. We can save our world! So now, let's formally introduce Notch, which is a self-designed, self-coded app. The judging process was impossible. There were so many projects that were worthy of being signaled out. We won both the Most Likely to Go Viral Award, and we also won the Climate Quest Award. With an alternate reality game, you don't have that distinction between the real and the fictional. We really wanted to experiment with what another form of community might be like. As important as doing this at the University of Chicago was, we'd also like to create a game that could be replicated at other universities or other institutions. Alternate reality games are us trying to iterate, but also trying to train a generation to really be able to think and to engineer. They aren't high school students anymore. They're not quite college students yet. So it's this liminal space in which they're figuring out who they are and who they want to be. That openness allows for a time of change. And so we think it's a really powerful moment to seed ideas and ambitions so they can spend the four years not just taking their courses and being defensive, but also imagining how the world could be a better place. When I first received the email and the clue, I was really excited. I was like, I came to the right university. They're doing these like cool puzzle things that no other universities are doing. And just seeing how excited all of these people were about learning and discovering things this way. It was a really great way to like give me a community over the summer. It helped me make friends um, by setting me up to make friends. <laughs> it was both engaging and scary to communicate with the future. It induces a lot of paradoxes that still make me very uncomfortable, but it's also like invigorating. To see the impact that our actions have. Knowing that someone constructed this so cleverly that you can piece it together in like a meaningful, beautiful way. Your choices matter, and it is the actions that you make and the, the science that you do and what you do that caused this to happen. We give you this knowledge, what are you going to do about it?
Okay, so, um, so we're basically gonna stop there so we can have a chance to talk about any aspects of either games, serious games, uh, alternate reality g games or anything else. And because we have Dave in the audience too, if there are any questions about the constructions of the physical spaces which are so important to this and distinguish these games from video games, we can also, we could also move those questions over to you, Dave. Um, so yeah, um, are there any questions in the audience? I think we have Mike somewhere as well. Somewhere over there. And if not, I mean, we really can go all day about talking about these things. It's just, we'd Please much rather us. hear from you. <laughs> Hi, thanks for that. <coughs> Pardon me. Thanks for that interesting talk. Um, you know, as someone who's taught video games and read theory and things like that, I always find this word serious kind of interesting. So, you know, when you go back to Huizinga and, you know, there's the seriousness of play. So, you know, a game is, uh, when you're in the game or in this magic circle or so forth, there's this seriousness. But then I think with someone like Ian Bogost and I guess you guys as well, you know, there's this idea that there are these serious games which seem to suggest that there's this, you know, real world impact that gaming, you know, and I'm not talking about like gamification, which we, we you know from countless other contexts. And I, you know, I guess I'm, I'm always curious I mean, you know, with this, even with this video, I mean, I, I loved all these puzzles and the fact that people were actually, uh, that they've, uh, I particularly like the mastermind thing because I, one of the first video games I ever programmed was mastermind, you know, on a VIC-20 back in like the 1980s. So, you know, people get involved in these games because they're genuine puzzles and so forth. But then there's always this kind of like, well, it helped me meet some friends or it helped me learn something about the climate change. And I always find that that kind of, you know, that that that's a line to straddle. You know, I mean, things are fun, and if you're a game enthusiast like Wazinga, it's like maybe the seriousness of games is all the serious we need, seriousness we need, rather than then making this argument that we play these games to then lead us to something else that's a little bit more altruistic. So that's that's I don't know if that's a question or just a problem. No, it's a, it's a really good problem, and I can, uh, I mean, I think I speak for both of us when yeah. I say, like, we don't particularly like the term serious games. Yeah. We, we throw it we out because it. it's useful useful shorthand for a certain kind of conversation and, like, starts a conversation, especially for folks who, who aren't reading the same kinds of texts. Um, but, I but I will say, you know, like, um, in, in a more general way, like, I, I just finished working on a book thinking about the form of games and the metaphor of games and just how in part, how prevalent it's become since like um, the mid 20th century. So now, you know, like when we talk about um, economics and finance, for instance, the metaphor of games comes up all over the place. Or if you look at like the way that elections get talked about, like the rhetoric of games gets used constantly in terms of like electoral contests and um, even the coverage of the, of the recent yeah. ongoing elections um, is not so formally dissimilar from the way, way that like ESPN covers uh, basketball games or things like that. Um, and you could just like go on um, w well beyond that with like examples of places where, um, where games have moved beyond the kind of, you know, board games like Mastermind or chess or early video games or things like that and have so saturated the cultural imaginary um, with like 2.5 billion gamers in the world um, that they've become something slightly different. Maybe the, maybe the serious, Playful distinction isn't. I mean, I you know I don't I don't think it's adequate entirely, um, but but I do think maybe for a moment at least it marks um, something about games that exceeds the the kind of like limited time space of, mm -hmm. of what's going on with them. And I you know and I, I do think like when we d when we design like we're we, we also are really dissatisfied with educational games and the way in which they're basically interactive quizzes, right? So the way in which fun or pleasure or engagement oftentimes gets removed or relegated, right? And you only get the kind of superficial dimension of what a game is, but in fact, you have this very boring undertaking. So um, in the kind of embedded design, to take a term from Mary Flanagan that we used for a game like this, we're, we are thinking about outcomes that we want, like learning objectives. Um, but first and foremost, we're thinking about a story and a series of game mechanics and rules that will be generative and pleasurable for the, for the people engaging in them.
it creates a paradigm shift, right? If people are playing these games constantly, then this is their paradigm in which they're going to be looking at the world. And so another thing that draws us to these alternate reality games is that it becomes this space where people, again, already in that paradigm of games and that language to actually get them to enact some action on the world that they're in because it requires some kind of real world element that's a little bit different from your screen-based video games or just your board games, right? It moves people into the real world and would continue to build that world out further on. And I think, I mean, we try not to be particularly humorless. Like, we play a lot of Mario Kart and stuff like yeah. that. So it's not it's not like we don't <laughs> like games that are just fun or D&D or, right. or whatever, which, you know, like maybe we take them a little too like seriously. Campaigns. Oh, my God. Yes. Um, but, it's, but, it, but it's a good point. I mean, I think it's a, it, like, as you've said, like, it's a problem and and a good point. Um, and and it's it's actually it's a, it's not a term that I try to use in print very often right. in presentations. Like it has like a lubricating function for right. conversation, but yeah. yeah. Hello, um, thank you for your presentation. I was wondering, uh, you were talking about this. Uh, sorry, this willingness to play in this kind of blur between the game and reality. And I was wondering to what extent the players were blurring these lines themselves and how they were kind of, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, at which point maybe if there was any breaking point, they were saying like, okay, now we're playing a game versus maybe at the beginning wondering what this was about and wondering if this was reality. Because apparently there was this kind of confusion at first and then we see them also doing quests and using you know, gaining points and stuff which are very, you know, game-related vocabulary. So I was wondering about that. Yeah, I'm going to, Ashlyn, if you want to speak to Terrarium in a moment, I'm just yeah. going back to the list of games um, that we've worked on because this very question of the kind of blurring that happens there is something that's mm -hmm. interested us for years. Um, and I think, like, uh, in some of these games, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one quick story about the Parasite. Maybe I'll start there, actually. So. Mm -hmm. Um, when Dave was building these these huge structures, which took months and months and months to build these huge book structures, um, we were doing this in uh, the Arts Center at the University of Chicago in um, in the kind of the building woodworking space. And um, the players were all online at that point or around the world, but they started thinking about like, wait, they keep describing these structures, do they really exist? And then they started um, watching little bits of video that we were giving them and, and trying to figure out where that space was. And eventually through like a long conversation on GroupMe, they figured out like, oh, maybe this is this like art space. And they also consulted with current students and stuff like that. And so they kept sending like delegations of students to try to like inspect that space. So we kept having to like hide it because there was like a window that would look down onto the space where you all were working. And at one point we had to like within a few minutes like cover over that space so they wouldn't that, so they wouldn't yeah. see it. Or at one point they thought that maybe this was a game and that I was somehow involved because I was like the only person on, at the university faculty wise who was working on games. And so they like were like, maybe we should go to his website and see if he's working on this kind of thing. So I very quickly like changed my website and claimed that I was like in New Orleans <laughs> working on like a board game project and not an alternate reality game. And I managed to like get that new web page up 30 seconds before they discovered it. And they were like, oh, he's in New Orleans. He's not working <laughs> right. on this. Um, so anyway, so that's not an example of the blurring. But at one point, they actually met the one day that we weren't on campus was Sundays, not working on this. And they managed to get on campus on Sunday. So two students went in with like their mother and like convinced the security guard through this like social hack basically to like get into the the woodworking space and, and found these like these foundations of, of the eventual sculptures and took pictures of them, which like completely altered what we had to do in order to keep the non-game going in some ways, right? So there are these like amazing moments where like we had to throw out all of this design as a result of their really weird discovery and unexpected discovery in what we thought was a lockdown space. Um, and it did in fact require us to rewrite tons of yeah. stuff, uh, but it created new characters, it created new puzzles that we hadn't had before. or. Uh, Seed is another example yes. where we did a game like this, and this is actually an image from the Seed game, um, which was a kind of maybe spiritual precursor to the room with the uh, the tree that Dave built. 
Um, but in this game, which was also a future uh, communication narrative, uh, we were working with a group of high school students who would come to campus every day, students from the south side of Chicago, um, and uh, mostly public school students. And they, uh, they really did buy into the fact mm -hmm. that this whole narrative was happening, in part because we wore, wore lab coats, right, which were a sign of authority, which yeah. was done on purpose, mm -hmm. right? And partially because when we were, so this was a time communication device, and when we first started working on it, all of the ideas that we had were straight out of like bad Hollywood sci-fi films, right? So it would be like the Back to the Future car, it would be the, you know, the H.G. Wells uh, time machine, and there were all these like mechanical things. And at one point we were like, oh, but those, those are tropes. Those are like, they're gonna know that this is straight out of some kind of genre. They're not gonna think this is real. So we thought to ourselves like, how do we make them think for a moment that this is real. So we bring them to campus, we have all these events, we tell them, we're gonna show you the time communication device in a couple of days. At a certain point, they all start saying, this is bullshit, this, right. this is not real. And we, we had this whole vocabulary yeah. for the time communication device and like quantum, quantum botany and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, and, and eventually we built this room which was in the basement of an academic building. And you walk into this room, it, you know, there's this like blue tint, and, and this is a really important detail, the ground was covered with grass, right? So like you would never expect to walk into an academic building and have that, that tactile mm. sensory experience. And that in combination with a bunch of other things led a series of students who were total skeptics right. coming into the room. And by the time they were coming out, we had footage of them with like their eyes wide being like, oh my God, there's, way. And, and, and the way we convinced them was like through historical information, right? So, so. And ritual and ritual. Mm -hmm. So like with historical information, like in 1942, right, the University of Chicago was the place where the first nuclear experiments took place prior like to the Manhattan Project, right, like in, in, in these early moments. And so the atom bomb, which at that point was utter science fiction, right, I mean like nothing like a weapon that could destroy the world or destroy that number of people had ever existed, mm -hmm. right, and we told them this story, we said like okay, back then er people would have thought that was science fiction, but now we have a time communication device, like that may seem like science fiction to you, it doesn't to us. And, and so we weren't trying to fool them, we weren't trying to lie to them, we were trying to like invite them into a form of like world creation, mm -hmm. right, um, and we know this, especially in a po whatever post-truth or whatever other terrible term you want to use for this particular moment of propaganda that we're in with, you know, Cambridge Analytica and, and, and all the things that came after that. Um, but it's a moment in which we, we can see more than ever how much information and worldviews are constructed. Um, one way to fight that is to throw truth at, at a problem, but that seems not to be working in many cases, especially in politics. Um, another way is to construct more convincing alternate realities that people would rather rather live in um, than the ones that they have. And I think that has become a large part of, of these kinds of projects and a large impetus for blurring game in everyday life. I, I don't know if you have like a terrarium example that you want to I mean, I have a terrarium example. Um, really, really quick, because I know that we have other questions in there. So we did purposefully separate the futures design challenge from this kind of Twitch-based experience that we created, because again, we wanted to capture a group of students who probably would not be interested in whatever we were doing with this live action kind of situation. Um, and so that's why we kind of gamified it, getting students who are really interested in like competition and points. Um, but I think really an example of that is the fourth world where they said, where, and you actually saw this, um, one of the students said, well, what if we decided to not make a choice? In the world of overpopulation, we had about 11 people in the room, and we had to go through this game show where one person had to be chosen to be the anchor who would then reset the future. Well, we always intended for like one person to be chosen, um, but they decided to not make a choice. And so the moment that they decided to not make a choice and the moment that the stream cut out, we had to have long conversations about, okay, well, what does this mean when they do an, an action that we're not necessarily, we didn't necessarily think through what that would look like, but we have to actually respond to it, right? Um, and so I think they, didn't, they thought that this wouldn't mean anything to them, and we actually went ahead and said, well, the fact that we need an anchor and you chose not to make a choice, that means that the future is now in your hands. There is no anchor. You have to reset the future yourself, right? So this is a moment of like honoring their, their, you know, their choice while also making a statement of, do you understand the implications 
of not making a choice. Not making a choice is also a choice within itself, and it has its own implications. I'm curious about the initial email for Terrarium, about how explicit that invitation was, that it was a game. Or, I mean, well, that it wasn't a game, but how explicit was it, and were there students who didn't see it? Yeah, I, I mean, so, so we've done the email thing twice. Like, there were different rabbit holes for the earlier games, but both Parasite and Terrarium had versions of that. Um, with Parasite, because it was a secret society and it was something so imminent to university system, which is, like, why we chose that trope in some ways, there was, like, really heavy debate about, um, like, there were many weeks when people thought it wasn't a game. They thought, like, the website had been hacked because it was so integrated into the university architecture. Um, they thought they thought many things. Um, with Terrarium, I think we were trying to be less paranoid in some ways, right? So these games do inspire paranoia. I think a very creative paranoia where you start seeing patterns where they might otherwise not exist. And as designers, you learn to like see the misrecognitions of the players and incorporate them rather than saying, no, you're wrong, that's not part of the narrative, saying, hmm, how could we make that part of the narrative and like, yes and the thing that's going on at a, at a large scale, right? Um, and so with this email for Terrarium, we had basically, the puzzle was that uh, there were various bolded letters that spelled select all, and at the end, if you select it all, you got to this link and eventually, through many steps, led to a website. I mean, I think in my anecdotal sense is that there were people who weren't sure about the reality status of Terrarium, mm -hmm. but there was, there was more of a sense that it was, I mean, th they also had access to the Parasite online, right? So some of them eventually found the articles that had been written about that game, and so we're like, oh, this must be another alternate reality game. Um, so we managed to like stave off that suspicion for a few weeks, but we couldn't hold on to it yeah. for several months, having done this before. Yeah, um, thank you, first of all, for the talk and all of the work. Uh, I guess, like, perhaps on a follow-up to that question in terms of the blurring of reality and fiction slowly corroding as time goes by, did you find that that affected player participation at all um, in the sense that at the University of Chicago there are events that are very much created as Luddick events, like humans versus zombies or mm -hmm. scav, but people still take those incredibly seriously. Um, on a other note, there's been a lot of, like this is a really great project and there's been a, like with a lot of smart people and with a lot of sm resources, but it's still kind of like very much embedded in an institution, which is the university. And I'm wondering like, is there potentially a more DIY way to do this, like with, um, you know, like just less institutional, I suppose. Do you want to take the first part of the question? Uh, yeah. Um, can you can you ask? I'm sorry. Can you s mention the first part of your question again, like the blurring of the lines? Uh, yeah. I'm just wondering if that affected how player engagement changed yeah. because. Perfect. Perfect. Um, so for Terrarium, we kind of had two, again, kind of two separate groups of players that we were um, kind of like managing at the same time. So uh, with 1,800 people to try and engage into our project, for the Futures Design Challenge, we managed to have about 35 groups of students of three to five um, sign up and actively participate. Some of them played through the uh, live action components, but not many of them did. Some of, they saw a design challenge, they understood what was being asked, and some of them just signed up and then solely worked on that. Um, we saw a little bit of attrition there, but not too much. In terms of the game, again, it was kind of a separate audience, and we had a I think while we had probably a large group of people um, watching the videos and interacting on our website, um, we had probably about like a, about a thousand views of the website and quite a few hundred views of our videos. The people who were active in the like Twitch uh, conversation um, was a much smaller uh, number of people. So it's really kind of like focused on that community aspect. Um, so so again, it's kind of a two separate 
uh, uh, groups of people that we manage and not really seeing a blurring between those two. Yes, please show us the numbers. So good. Mm. Just, just to back you up. Yes. Right, so these are kind of our engagement and our numbers. Um, so in terms of the kind of the, uh, the letter that was sent out, um, we had probably about 600 some folks interacting with all of the puzzles um, and a lot of views of the website. Many people, once they you know, saw the uh, Google Doc um, and saw all the information, they went to the website of forecastlab.com and were like, what is this? What's going on here? So a lot of engagement there. But Engagement means different things, right? Playing, uh, meaning solving the puzzles, talking to people on Discord, which we were also in their Discord channels, their GroupMe channels, just kind of seeing what was happening there. Our Twitch channels had about 1,800 people watching it. Some of them were undergraduate students at UChicago. Some of them were grad students. Some of them were just, we were sharing the link around. So we're not sure who and where they were, but quite a few active views. Um, on Twitch, yeah. Really briefly on the institution question, when I first started working on alternate reality games, I did try to make things more DIY. Actually, the lesson that I learned was that like defining one's like local is really important, and like the institution of the University of Chicago, which is not like the form that we always want to do this in, um, but had certain kinds of benefits, both at the level of like funding and player base and stuff like that. Um, also seemed like a large group, but not so large that we would lose, like, like we, knew, we knew who we were making this for in some ways. And these are also people who will be in interesting and influential positions going forward. And so it is like um, a group that we thought would play the game and would get something out of it. This is not to say that like you couldn't do it at a larger scale. You absolutely could. And we've been talking about the possibility of what it would mean to do this game um, with with a larger population and a more diverse population beyond a university player base, but uh, but it was interesting to see experimentally how much of that group we could get, um, and these numbers actually don't account for like participation on the website going beyond the wormhole, for instance, or also like engaging current students who then like were interested as spectators and, and things like that. But but there are definitely a lot of publics for whom you and with whom you could do this kind of thing. Right. Like when we did Seed, we did yeah. it with like, you know, like um, black and Latinx uh, high school students right. on the south side of Chicago. Very different player right. base, very different series of interactions. Right. And that gave us a different level of affordance, right? When we're thinking about the south side of Chicago and the university, a lot of the st uh, students and community members don't view that the university as a place that is for them. And so then this becomes a really interesting moment to flip that institutionalization on its head and say, actually, hey, we have a game for you where you are actually allowed to run around campus and interact with these buildings and in ways that you never thought were possible all because you interacted with a game. Um, I have a question. Uh, this was so wonderful. Thank you both so much. I'm such a fan of all this work. Uh, but I wanted to ask a question about, uh, there's one moment that I found really fascinating, which is uh, in the long history of art, uh, as we all know, the forces of capitalism always capture and subsume and reverse the avant-garde, right? So there's this narrative where, you know, structural film leads to MTV or, you know, people argue that Vertov gave us the internet. Um, and you made this really amazing argument, which is that ARGS is maybe one of the first forms that takes a corporate marketing strategy, the viral marketing or guerrilla marketing that you might have seen with like the matrix, even using the word rabbit hole right around the year 2000, to create a new subversive or, or politically charged art form. Uh, this is something I'm really interested in, like uh, emergent genres uh, coming out of Instagram or um, TikTok or uh, a wide variety of corporate platforms where like what seems to me the most radical forms of art are coming out of these corporate structures and out of these corporate platforms. And so I'm really inspired about the way you're imagining ARGs doing that. And I'd love to hear more um, about when creating Terrarium or these other games, what it was you were looking at. I mean, on the one hand, you have the history of the avant-garde and fluxus and situationism, but what, what inspired you, how did you, take those corporate elements to produce something new? Like, what did that process look like? Mm 
Yeah, and, and I want to like also critique myself for like maybe how I said that. I mean, I, I, I do believe some version of that narrative, but it's also true that a lot of the people working on like The Beast or I Love Bees or these kind of like early alternate reality games were also like really great artists and sci-fi writers and game designers, right? Who just like needed employment and so were employed by Microsoft or, or, or companies that wanted to engage in this kind of viral marketing. So even that, that stage in some ways is more complex than I was giving it credit for. Uh, but still, like, it's in the service of like selling stuff, right, at, at that early moment. Um, I think, you know, we're inspired by a lot of things. I mean, Fluxus certainly comes up again and again, and a lot of the exercises that we ran with in our group were even thinking about like Fluxus event scores, right? So a lot of those, like, so a lot of ARGs are too puzzle heavy. And I mean, puzzle heavy in the sense of like things that have one correct answer. Um, and, and players find that really satisfying, and, and so we try to create like interesting puzzles mm -hmm. um, that are at least formally innovative, and that have so in this case something to do with climate change. We, we've also become really interested in like how to defy puzzles as much as possible, right? How to foreground narrative or open world dynamics or things where there isn't just one correct answer. And there we've been really inspired by uh, tabletop games, by things like World Without Oil um, that Ken Eklund and Jane McGonigal and a bunch of other people worked on um, in 2007, which I think of in some ways more as a collective uh, science fiction exercise than as a game. Um, and so like when we think about games, we think really capaciously as a series of experiences. Mm -hmm. And like we, you know, and so in some ways we oftentimes talk, talk about experience design before game design. Um, like games are interesting and they're a subset of what I think we do in, in these ARGs. But I, I would actually say that like mm -hmm. by calling this a game, Terrarium a game or the Parasite a game, like that's a way of getting funding for these things, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't actually think that what we're doing is a game at all. It's, it has something to do with marketing strategy, it has something to do with the modulation of affect and thinking about world building and, and trying to learn from like, say, neoliberal world builders, but trying to flip, flip that energy in a different direction. But yeah, but you're right, it's, it's like games, to call it a game gets it a, a different level of attention and it's not, not a game, right. um, but it's also, that's, that's not where the core of the energy is. Right. It's a really good question. I mean, it's, it's something that I think about a lot and I don't have easy answers to, but I do like these reverse cases mm -hmm. where, um, where, it, where it's artists like incorporating stuff in the other end. Like that's not the narrative that you usually get in sociology, for instance, mm -hmm. um, or um, yeah, or like Dick Hebdige on incorporation or something, right? Um, question again. Uh, I was wondering when you were describing your interactions with students, it's very much like one in a D&D game of the dungeon master, I guess. And one specific asset as a dungeon master is that you're sitting at the table with them while they're planning against you so that you can, if not necessarily plot against them, at least plot with what they were saying. And so this yes ends that you were mentioning is kind of possible because you have at least an idea of what they're going to throw in your face. But in the context of this, because you were just sending an email to the students, how did you track their engagement with it? Because you said you were on their Discord, for instance. But uh, so I was wondering, did you have like moles among the students who would work for you? Uh, or did you maybe pretend to be a student at first and maybe start some tracks so that you could be inside those messenger groups or in that Google Doc and whatever? I'm just gonna say, I'll let Ashlyn answer this, but I have so many fake accounts. I That's couldn't. what I'm saying. The number of fake <laughs> Facebook accounts and Instagram, Twitter, like it's insane. Um, so first I'll say, uh, when thinking about these alternate reality game experiences, we classify ourselves as kind of like puppet masters, right? Like we're hidden behind this kind of curtain, like you don't really notice us, but we are supposed to be you know, making changes within the game world. Um, we have aligned ourselves with the players. Um, so the Forecast Lab is a space that was open to people. We were openly saying, hey, we need your help. We too are trying to figure out what's going on with this time communication thing, right? So it's a little bit different from being this opposition, like oppositional like agent, right? We are working collaboratively together, which meant that they were more likely to you know, talk to us, work with us, and give us information, and also add us to their Facebook gr uh, group, their Discord channels. 
Um, usually when the emails are sent, um, the university creates a Facebook group specific to the uh, class, and we ask to be added into that. So that's kind of our first uh, step. So we uh, pretend to be students, right? And we don't do too much of anything because we don't want to raise suspicion. Um, but we do engage with them and then ask them questions, right? Which then led us to go into the Discord channel. Um, we had 14 student interns um, and each of them were, like they are UChicago students and we told them, be just a slightly different version of your current self. We're not really asking people to like act and pretend to be a character for an extended period of time because it's really hard to stay in character for like what, six, months or so, no, but you can be yourself, right? Just be a slightly more extreme version of yourself, right? Um, so that allowed us to be, uh, become friends with them and whatnot, but we did also have to create all these Facebook accounts, right? And, and I would actually, this is like maybe a slightly, we haven't talked about this, but like a Ooh. slightly provocative way of thinking about this. I actually think Terrarium is the first time that we've ever made an ARG where there weren't puppet masters in the true sense. That's and, true. And I mean by that, like in every other case, like in Seed, we played these like terrible people with like white lab coats who were kind of the enemy a little bit. Yep. Um, and we were able to take, like absorb that emotional energy as a way of moving the narrative forward because people like having villains and enemies and stuff like that. But in Terrarium, like sure, there were people who were making the game at a first order mm -hmm. and deploying it. Um, but I mean, first of all, we were like really open to improvisation right. um, and to student ideas and like rebuilding stuff in real time, I think more than ever. But also, as you were saying, for, and this made me think of it, like from the very beginning, the idea was we're on the same side as right. you. We don't have any more information that you do, right? The secret society thing in the parasite, like the secret society knew like 500 times more right. than the players did. In the case of Terrarium, like we, we knew that we might communicate with the year 2049, but we didn't know what would happen at the moment that the Twitch connection went live. Or, or that's what we, we would tell them, right? right? So at least at the narrative level, there was a sense that we're, we're all on the same team and we're mm -hmm. figuring that, this out together. Wink, wink, that's an invitation to come in and, and world build as much as you possibly can. So we're not at the same table looking at one another, but we could be. You're welcome to come into the lab at any point. Right. And in fact, we had our, our construction space, like Dave's construction space and our construction space in, in the parasite was locked down, or we tried to kind of like hide it from them. In this case, almost everything, with the exception of the stuff that was in the year 2049, was like totally open to them. Right. And they could come in and talk to us at any point. Right. And I think that, that um, rather than producing paranoia, that right. produced apophenia, right? So the idea of like seeing patterns where they don't otherwise exist, but not thinking there's someone out to get me, mm -hmm. just thinking like maybe, maybe there's a way that I can recombine elements in the world and produce something new. Right. And this also kind of speaks to the fact that a lot of the costumes that we were wearing is actually a standard uniform that people at the Media Arts Data Design Center wear because we need a way to kind of signal to our to, uh, to the professional staff that our student staff are not just like studying in the space but are actually working in the space. So we have them wear blue lab coats because we happen to be in the science quad and so we're paying homage to them, right? And so the space was open and the student staff they wear these blue lab coats such that when we started the forecast lab and we're like, well, we all should continue to wear blue lab coats, right? It's a, again, a thing that was just normal for anyone who was entering to the space, right? <laughs> so again, it was just this kind of thing of like, oh, well, welcome, hello. You're actually in a space that you're already used to. Come check out our research. We need your help. So what you were just saying became true? But the lab coats actually started in the game, and they moved over into the no, center. The 100%. No, mm -mm. no, no. I, the, I was there when we decided. To the lab coats started before the game started. But they were they were created at the same time. No, but so what this, I'm, this, is an, this is an interesting. No, no, no. So what? I, so I specifically remember when we were starting <laughs> to open up the center. You were not. There, so I know that we were going to have these these blue lab coats. But I had to have a whole conversation yes. with the four other labs in the space about the fact that we want to reckon. So this is like a play of like, yes, right. but I also needed a way to signal to other people, right? right? But I'm saying like they, it, it happened before the game. 
right, right. Okay, so it got implemented before the game. It but, got implemented before the game. But it was game. an element of the world before it became, so like we thought of yes. it as a costume first, but it was implemented in the yes. lab before yes. it was implemented in the game, totally. Yeah. So, so we're in this weird situation right now where our game lab on campus like has this residue of this world that happened and there's this like mixing that we can't even like get to the right. origin of, of like what came oh first, like game or, or real life. So that's great. Yeah, I'm yeah. like, it's a whole thing. I have a, oh. Uh, I just had it, first of all, this is incredible and it's so exciting to see all the specifics and all the puzzles that you've created and just the world. Um, but I had a question about the students. So it seems like there were like 1,800 students that were admitted and then 600 or so were playing the game. For the, for the students who didn't play the game, were they aware that a game was happening and were they, uh, like, first of all, were you able to track the kinds of students who were sort of like following the breadcrumbs versus the ones who weren't? And were there any sort of trends behind, because obviously it's interdisciplinary, but was it like artists are more likely or scientists are more likely or, and also the people who weren't participating what was that experience for like like for them, and was there a reason for it, or was that a choice, or was that just lack of interest? That's a great question, and we actually have data on this because we were working with a sociologist, so we did like pre-post tests, we did focus groups with people afterwards. So in 2017, when we ran the Parasite, we realized we were really great at getting international students. We were really great at getting artists and certain kinds of humanists. We were really great at getting LGBTQ students, uh, which was a large part of that particular game. We were not great at getting uh, econ students. Econ is a huge major at the University of Chicago. Um, we were not so great at getting science students in some cases, or athletes. And so when we were designing Terrarium, I mean, I would actually say that that, that one third number for the rabbit hole, um, is true but deceptive. So like, if you think about it as an entire game, people are coming in and out of the experience at different moments. So there are these like hardcore players that Ashlyn described um, who are going all the way through, but it's, it's designed in such a modular way that people can have little subsets of the experience. And we've really designed with that in mind, that like nobody's, th like very few people are there for the marathon, some are there for like, small subsets. We've also like, I, I think with both the Parasite and Terrarium challenged the idea of rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we've, we've thought, thought about like a rabbit warren as a, as a different kind of metaphor where you think to yourself, well, the people who end up playing an alternate reality game aren't playing it for the same reasons, mm -hmm. right? There's like this group over here that's really into puzzles and finding the right answer. And there's this group over here that just likes the story and they want a good and deep story and they're gonna follow all of the lore, but they don't care about these puzzles. They get lost in those puzzles. And there's this other group that's like really into like games and not puzzles. And this other group that doesn't care about any of this nerdy stuff and just wants to make friends. And this is the best way to make friends. And this is, uh, anyway, so like we, at one point we made a list of like 11 different like pleasures that people get out of alternate reality games and design different rabbit holes to get each of those different kinds of players into the game, which is a very different approach from anything we had, we had ever done before. In 2019, I think we were much more successful at getting scientists and econ students along with the international mm -hmm. students. Um, it's always hard to get total numbers on this stuff because it's so fluid and multidimensional. Um, but I will say, the other thing that we did with Terrarium that was half successful, half unsuccessful, was thinking about what it means to get people who can be spectators and not players, yeah. right? Like we, when we think about Twitch or we think about uh, eSports, for instance, like there are a very small number of people actually playing the games and a huge number of people observing, right? Still interacting, still right. chatting, but mm -hmm. like not playing in a central way. And so the, the Twitch, um, which only partially succeeded in this. I think it could with a different kind of audience. Like, I actually think college students in an orientation were not the best time for the Twitch thing. I think that could have like much better success out in the open in some ways or with the Twitch community. But the other thing was like having the Futures Design Challenge where you had like 200 students who were presenting their ideas, but then a bunch of other students who could come and watch those ideas and maybe get inspired by what they saw their peers doing. So never before had we thought about those layers of like player, spectator, lurker mm -hmm. um, as different, um, not just ways into the game, but ways out of the game as mm -hmm. well.
Okay, it's I mean, hard for us to see, so I don't know if there are any other hands up or if we want to just... I just uh, have a, a very quick question. Um, you've been mentioning, you, you said yes and, which is what comedy improv, and you mentioned costumes and so forth. What, what about theatrical antecedents? Uh, or, or do you think of Auguste de Bois in the Theater of the Oppressed or the Happenings or Brecht when you're talking about, you know, uh, alienating someone from the, let's say, the games of culture? I mean, are there... Th the Theatrical, do you think about the theater, I guess, is what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, like, all the, all, all the time. Like, when I, so, like, in 2012, for instance, when I was working on Speculation, which was a game that I worked on with Catherine Hales and Patrick Lemieux, all of that was online, right? So there was, like, a little bit of, like, net prov, but there were no costumes, there was none of this theatrical stuff. And it was only around, like, 2013 that I started thinking about, like, what would it mean for ARGs to, like, really take seriously the history of theater and performance mm -hmm. um, and, and performance studies and, and um, performance art as well in some ways. So I think a lot about performance art, invisible theater, theater of the oppressed, absolutely. Brecht, I think about a lot in terms of games, but maybe not the exact kinds of aesthetics that we have within these worlds. Um, more something like invisible theater or even, you know, like sleep no more, um, which I think is both like fascinating and limited in, in what it produces, right? But these forms of like um, theater that take place not on a stage, but take place like in an entire building or where player interaction can play some meaningful role. Um, and then, of course, like the history of improv is huge to this. And that, to me, actually isn't just comedy, though that's a really important touch point. It's, al it's also uh, martial arts, for instance, right? Like judo or something like that. It's jazz. It's, um, it's everyday speech, right? So linguists write a lot about how improv enters into like the ways that we have everyday conversations and stuff like that. Um, but improv oftentimes is something that happens with like one-on-one -on -one or in very small groups of people. And so for us, it's a question of taking those histories and thinking about like if you have several hundred players or several thousand players, mm -hmm. how might improv operate at that scale um, where you don't want to be entirely decentralized because the th then the thing doesn't feel intentional, um, but you don't want to be so centralized that it's just replicating what's good about um, film or traditional theater or stuff like that. Um, and my background is uh, coming from, I was trained by folks who worked at Disney. And so the folks there uh, also have kind of a theater background, but also thinking about location-based entertainment, not only just theme parks, but thinking about how, how can we actually build a world and have thousands of people walk through it and you have these characters who are from other stories interact with player, people all the time, right? And you have these characters throughout the entire park, multiple instances of these characters, right? Um, and so when I think of this kind of work, yes, it's from theater, but also I think coming from this like interactive, interaction design, experience design, part game, part, you know, live performance. I mean, one other thing to add on the theater front, like there's a lot of interesting stuff happening certainly in New York, I'm sure there is in LA as well, I just don't know it. Um, not to sleep no more, but also things like, there was this, this production a couple of years ago, and then she fell, which was this interactive production where you're like in a house, and they're actually giving you like little vials of alcohol, and you're basically in an Alice in Wonderland style space. I mean, I think it was nothing more than alcohol, as far <laughs> as I can tell. Um, but it's, you know, like, um, and you're led through these different spaces, but you get to have semi-improvised interactions with actors, sometimes one-on-one. -on -one. And I, I find that really powerful. Like I've had, like in any one of these productions, there's only like 5% or 10% that I really attach to, but there are moments where, like there was this one production I went to in New York where um, at one point I was hanging out with this actor who um, was in a bathroom and at one point asked me to like hand over articles of clothing for her to get dressed because she's naked. So there's this moment of like awkwardness and intimacy possibly with someone who's naked and like where do you look and what do you do? And at one point she comes out and and, and the question that she asked was like, um, how old were you when you first fell in love? And then it asked these series of like intimate questions, right? That like you wouldn't expect in a theater production. And we've never quite, you know, done done something like that with these ARGs, but like 
those moments are ones that I feel like I really want to build on. Like, I don't get those moments so often mm -hmm. from video games, sometimes representationally, but in terms of the live back and forth, I mean, you get them from like MMOs and sometimes multiplayer games that are like Journey, maybe, mm -hmm. right? You get that set of emotions from. But, um, but there's something really powerful about forms of avant-garde or experimental interactive theater that I think games could learn a great deal more from. I'm not sure what time we're supposed to stop. I don't know yeah. either. Like, I can keep going. We were told, but we, we, we forgot. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know if there's someone who's like an adjudicator of the, of the time out in the audience. Um, it keep the questions coming. Or yeah, not. We're glad I don't know. Someone, someone will kick us out. Or they won't. And we'll just sit here. Ooh. Any, any, any other questions? Happy to speak informally, too, afterwards. Anyway, thank you all very much. Yeah. Appreciate it.